Well, we're about five o'clock, so just want to thank everybody for coming. I'm Chris Martin. I'm the 2020 president of the Columbia Board of Realtors, and uh, we're very excited to have everybody here, um, especially all the uh, candidates that are um, in attendance tonight. We really appreciate it. And I just wanted to introduce our wonderful moderator for the evening, David Lyle of KFRU. Thank you. I appreciate being able to uh, be here also, and I'll also say thank you all for being here. The last time I was at an event when Dr. Steepleman was there, it was a uh, call-off school the next day event too. <laughs> so if you, uh, you will tell us that, right, if it happens while you're still here? Um, yes. <laughs> Here's how we do this tonight. Um, we're going to have a uh, opening statements from all of the candidates, and then we we'll have a couple of minutes for that. And then when we start questions, I have some questions from the board. I have some questions that others have given me already ahead of time for the school board candidates, and have 90 seconds to answer the questions. And then if we feel like we want to follow up, we can give them extra time, like 30 seconds for a follow up. And we'll try to rotate. The best I can remember so that not the same people go first and last each time I'll do the best I can to do that and then after uh, about an hour and or so we will uh, wrap up our conversation with the school board candidates and they'll have another two minutes to uh, wind down and say anything that they feel like saying at that point in time so that's pretty simple we'll also take questions from you if you have questions we'll get to a certain point after a while after we've kind of gotten into a routine here and then the microphone is set up right there in the middle of the aisle and if you have a question for the candidates, then please stand at the microphone or catch my attention and we'll let you ask that question also. The uh, school board race this year, there are three that will be of uh, this four that should be elected to uh, serve on the school board. Two of the four up here are incumbents. Two are trying to uh, win a spot of those three spots and it's a three year term. So let's start, uh, why don't we start with some on this end with Helen Wade and uh, it, we'll just go down and again the uh, timekeepers are right there on the front row they'll give you kind of a 30 second warning and then a stop when you see that orange come out that's where you should start to wind down although nobody here comes and slaps you on the knuckles if you go a little bit longer we're pretty loose on this but uh, try to stay to that uh, to that length of time and they'll give you the the um, the countdown in the morning so we'll start at this end and work that way very good thank you very much David Thanks for having us all here tonight um, in the beautiful weather that we are experiencing here in Columbia. Um, as David said, my name is Helen Wade. Um, I've been a citizen here in Columbia for almost 30 years. Um, I've been practicing law for just a little bit more than 16 years, and my focus is um, on family law. So the houses that you sell to the people who live in Columbia house the families that I serve, both in my professional life and as a member of the Board of Education. Um, I am seeking my fourth term as a member of the Columbia Board of Education. I've been serving this community for nine years. Um, people ask all the time, why do you keep doing this? And the answer is that I believe that a strong public school is the key, the backbone, and the foundation of a strong community. Every single one of us, whether we have students in school or we don't, benefits from the contributions that a strong public school system makes to the community, both economically and otherwise. There is much work to do in Columbia. We've had many successes. Um, our voters have been very generous in approving um, the bond requests that we have made of them and have allowed us to improve the facilities that we have and build new facilities to serve the growth that this community experiences. In the upcoming three years, we're gonna to continue to battle those kind of wonderful challenges that continue to present themselves to the schools. Um, we'll be opening a new middle school and we'll be seeking new ways to meet the challenges that our changing population uh, brings to the school district and the growth that is brought to the school district as well. We need to continue to be good stewards of the taxpayers' funds, your money, uh, to meet and exceed the expectations of all of you and to make sure our kids get a second to none education. Again, my name is Helen Way. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening. I'm Jonathan Sessions. Again, thank you to the board, uh, the Columbia Board of Realtors, for having this forum. It's, uh, this is this is unique for school boards. This is my first time uh, being at this forum. Um, so I'm running for a fifth term. Uh, I it's but ten years. I my first term was a completion term, and I've I've had four full terms since then. 
Um, I'm a Columbia native. I actually grew up here in Columbia, Missouri. Um, the house I grew up in is uh, off of Scott Boulevard in an area of county that the city has fully engulfed around. So, uh, that many of the people in this room can guess which neighborhoods so that might be. Uh, I went to the University of Columbia uh, after going to Columbia Public Schools. I earned a degree in music education. Uh, I chose not to go into teaching. Uh, I am not a practicing educator. Uh, I, I started a, a computer consulting business while I was a student at MU, um, and I've been doing that ever since. Uh, it's, it, the company's Gravity, it's downtown. Um, we're, the, we're the Apple folks. Um, <coughs> I uh, am a member of the Chamber of Commerce um, and been actively involved in this community, whether it's uh, leading choral ensembles, youth groups, um, giving back to the community at organizations such as like Ragtag and uh, True False Film Festival. Um, again, the important question is, so why, we, why, why do I want to run again? Because we're, we're talking, it's been 10 years now. Uh, I recognize that Columbia Public Schools was an integral part of my success. It, it was truly my foundation. And I recognize that it's the foundation of what makes Columbia the place that we want, that people want to live. Uh, over the last 10 years, uh, Columbia Public Schools has been catching up. We've been getting out of the business of trailers and we're almost there. The next 10 years is gonna be about keeping up because this community is a community that's growing and we need to make sure that we're prepared for that. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Seaman. Um, I thank everybody for coming out. Thank my brother named David Lyle for moderating this great event. Uh, I am a Columbia transplant. I am from what is now known as the other Columbia, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, my family arrived here in uh, 2003. I was a sophomore going to Rockbridge. Um, it's only here for those three years, but Columbia Public Schools in those three years uh, put me on the path to where I am today. I met my lovely wife there. Uh, we had our first child as senior and junior at Rockbridge. Um, it's a pretty transformative experience. And the teachers and staff and counselors that were there uh, got us to where we are today. Uh, attended Columbia College, joined the Marine Corps as an officer after I finished college. And we moved out to North Carolina. We enjoyed it, we loved the East Coast, but when it was time to exit the military, we decided that Columbia was home and we wanted to come back and give something back to the community that gave us our start. Uh, I say all that to say that Columbia Public Schools has a fond place in my heart. It is the reason why I'm able to sit with these three great candidates at this table tonight. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. Um, I don't know where I, what I would be doing. Those three years were formative and as a father of three children, two of whom are in Columbia Public Schools right now, one on the way, I want to be there to ensure that they have the same opportunities that their mother and father had, that, that their friends and parents had. Um, and that's why I'm running. So, thank you. Chris? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us out. Uh, my name is Chris Horn. Um, I have been in Columbia for about 10 years. Uh, my parents were in the Air Force, so I had the benefit of being able to move every four or five years growing up. Um, came over as a, to attend the University of Missouri. And so uh, shortly afterwards, I started working at my current employer, Shelter Insurance, where I am now a uh, reinsurance manager. Um, I've moved a couple of times since starting at Shelter, um, but uh, my wife and I moved back in 2017, and uh, this is our home. <clears throat> um, you know, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey for me, particularly since we moved back. Um, I've had the benefit of going through Leadership Columbia class in 2019, um, while simultaneously doing some um, some work for myself, or on myself, through some NCCJ training that was put on by my employer, Shelter Insurance. And through that training, I learned a lot about myself. Um, I learned a lot about some privileges that I grew up with, some agencies that I grew up with, and you know, learning about myself and also learning about Columbia as a whole and particularly our educations um, through our education day through leadership columbia i just learned that you know um, now that i know better it's time to do better and so that's why i'm here um, you know I, I want to be able to be in a position to give back to a community that gives so much to others and uh, you know i want to be able to uh, be in a position with our schools um, you know to make sure that you know my children who are who are soon to be in the system um, 
be able to enjoy, you know, the good quality public schools that are here, just keep it going. Um, you know, what we stand for, um, we stand for teachers and, and, you know, making sure that they have a positive work environment. Um, you know, we stand for equity and inclusion and we stand for, um, <coughs> Excuse me, we stand for you know some expansion of our early childhood education programs and so that's what we hope to see that's what we hope to accomplish in addition to all the new work that's been taking place so far so thank you for having us here tonight thank you for your opening statements please feel free to come and sit down here if you don't want to stand back there we know a lot of people are still uh, just getting off work and trying to make their way here and especially with the weather like it is it kind of slows people down we're at the market. Now I'm gonna run before. You've made that decision already. I don't have the text yet. Oh, it's coming. Uh, <laughs> I heard it here first. Schools so canceled. Can, you can text your kids, which uh, I did at the other event, and I texted my daughter when uh, Dr. Stephen was at an event two weeks ago, and I told her school's out tomorrow. She texted back. She said, "You're joking, aren't you?" Because it hadn't been publicly announced yet. But it shortly was after that, and she started texting her friends saying, "You want to know it first? And they didn't believe her either. So, uh, but no school tomorrow. So let's uh, let's talk about schools. What to be tomorrow? Sorry, we not all the all the parents in the room. <laughs> No, um, thanks, to, thanks, Dr. Steepleman. I want to start with uh, Jonathan Sessions on this one. Hi. Since you are running for re-election, but what one event or one person really kind of impacted you to make the decision the first time to run or this time to run for re-election? Some of this you've already kind of talked about, but I want more specifics about making that decision because I think it's tough to run for a position, school board or any position. You put yourself out there, you have these kinds of forums, and this is the first one of probably many that you have between now and April. But for each of you, I'm gonna ask, a, and a person or an event, or it could be a cause that really makes you say, Yes, I want to. I want to make this commitment. Um, so I shared in my opening statements that I have a degree in music education that I've I've never never used in a classroom. Um, but there um, there was actually a professor of mine at the university as I after I graduated. Um, uh, she was getting her her PhD, uh, and that was Dr. Erica Neville. Uh, she is now the principal of uh, principal of Douglas High. Um, our alternative high school. She was she was still she was one of my professors, and um, she was still a professor at the time. I'd gotten out of school, and I had watched a lot of. Um, we we just come off a pretty turbulent time from the Columbia Public Schools. We had had a uh, it's just a toggle. Uh, we had had a lot of um, a, a, we had had a lot of uh, turmoil. Um, we had a lot of individuals get on the board of education with an axe to grind. Um, and, and I recognize that, that that's not a good reason to get on the Board of Education uh, because if, if you have one item, if you have a small agenda when you're running for the Board of Education, at some point you're going to realize that you're managing a system that serves 19,000 students. There are over 3,000 employees in the Columbia Public Schools. There's a lot going on. It is a big picture job. Uh, and Dr. Neville uh, actually encouraged me to, to recognize in myself that through my degree in education, growing up in town, the committees uh, when this, and the council, uh, the, the city council things that I've been on, that I would be, that had the tools in my tool belt uh, that would make me a good board member, and that was at the ripe old age of 26. So um, that's, that's the person that I could, that you could blame for making it happen, I guess. <laughs> Um, so, I'm going to be honest, I was kind of asked to run for school board, and it started out as a very small contingent of phone calls and, and things, and then turned into this bigger wave of folks, and I'm still not positive that it wasn't my wife behind it. Just trying to get <laughs> but, um, after I was asked, I started looking into these things, and as a parent of three, um, you want to be involved in your kids' lives and their, and their education. And, one of the parent-teacher conferences is great, but sometimes it, things get lost in the mix. Um, you start looking at some of these issues, and there were some issues there that I felt were important. And the decision really was made for me when I started thinking back to my time at Rockbridge. I had a counselor named uh, Miss Jane Pister. She's no longer working at Rockbridge. She's, I believe she's at Mizzou now, but she was uh, almost a guardian angel for me, for my, myself, my family, my brother, my mom. Uh, my father had passed away before my senior year. Um, as I said before, we 
my wife and I had our child our senior year. Uh, Mrs. Peaster guided me from this troubling place in my life to where I am today. So I thought about what would Ms. Peaster want me to do? What would she want me to give back to this school district that she worked almost 30 years for? And I thought, this is what I should be doing. I should be in injecting myself into the policy and the procedures at Coleman Public Schools. Not just for her, but for all of our kids, for my kids, for Chris's kids, for everybody's kids in Coleman. So that's why. Chris Wall. Uh, for me, David, um, there was an event and there's a person, so hopefully I can break the rules. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I got to participate in Leadership Columbia. And we had, we had several different days that covered a lot of things in everything Columbia, but my favorite days were Social Services Day and Education Day. And I can say that's when the seed was planted. I think about kind of when I was an undergrad and at times I lived in Columbia, you know, there was perception that certain schools were better than the others. Uh, but when I went through Education Day at Leadership Columbia, that just broke down everything that I understood about Columbia Public Schools. And so, uh, so that was the event that really, you know, being able to take care of that or, or take part in that. Um, really the person that influences me the most to do this is my wife, um, Amanda. She actually has the pleasure of, uh, of serving our youth in our Columbia Public Schools. And you know, I just get an inside glimpse of every day of what it's like to be a teacher in our district. And um, you know, I get to see what it's like for these, these hardworking individuals to put everything that they've got and pour into these kids. And so um, you know, that's motivating to me. Plus, I can't do this without her, you know, without her support. So, um, so really that's where the motivation comes to do this. Helen Wade. Well, um, I'm going to jump on the parent bandwagon for a minute, but when I started uh, this journey, my daughter was uh, entering kindergarten. Um, and there's nothing more motivating than looking at your own child and knowing how deeply you want the very best for that little person for whom you are so responsible. Um, and I saw membership at that time on the Board of Education as a way to personally contribute to the kind of education that my child was able to get. So it was a very, very personal thought at that time. And I was lucky enough to serve then. And the longer I worked on the board, the longer I participated in the decisions that were uh, being made that really touched my child's life, I began to realize that service on the Board of Education really is a way to not just improve and participate in the kind of education our kids get, we get to participate in firsthand the kind of community that we all live in. So the first person to impact my choice was my daughter. I'm also an attorney. So I see a lot of kids in pain. I see a lot of kids in, in crisis. And I see their families in crisis. And I cannot tell you how often those children or those families talk about teachers as being the person that keeps them together, the person that is there for their families and those children who cares about them when perhaps they feel like nobody else does. Um, we do uh, have amazing teachers in our community um, and continuing to uh, recruit and retain the very best for every single one of our kids is one of the reasons that I think being a member of the Board of Education now continues to be so important because our kids are eventually what will be Columbia. Thank you, thank you all. Next question, and uh, David, you'll start with this one. We'll jump into one that's um, the, the current school board has had to face. What's your position, as you understand it right now, on parents recording meetings with the uh, school staff when they're talking about their children's IEP? Right, so like I said, as a parent, um, attending parent student conferences, it may last 10 to 15 minutes. My wife and I are sitting there, we're speaking with the teacher. We both have questions. Um, at the end, when you walk out of that building, we look at each other sometimes and go, what do we talk about? We talk about science, but what was, the, what was the grades? Do you have missing homework? What's the plan that we were coming up with? IEP meetings sometimes last almost three hours. You're asking a parent or a pair of parents to try to remember everything that's happening in that meeting that's dealing with their child. So you have to understand where those parents are coming from. You also have to understand where the teachers are coming from. Some of them feel anxious about having those meetings recorded. So 
Maybe they feel that way because they're not positive on what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Maybe they feel that way because there's a tape recorder in the room and suddenly I have to start speaking in a way that makes me feel uncomfortable or unprofessional. I understand those points on the teacher's end. I understand the points on the administrator's end. But if we are going to put our students and our parents first, then it should be allowed. You should be able to bring a tape recorder into that room, put it on the table and say, I would like to record this. Are you comfortable with that? Okay. This is for my child. We are on the same team. We want the same goal. So let's figure it out. So yes, I am in favor of recording. Um, yeah, that's, that's always tough because, you know, uh, we live in a live in a very litigious society today. Uh, and then, you know, there's, you know, there's some issues or there's concerns with the cost um, for storing the data that we require for the recording. Um, you know, but the way I feel, uh, like David mentioned, these meetings can take hours upon hours. And as a, as a parent uh, that would be in that situation, you're already emotionally connected to your child, obviously. And so um, there's probably a lot of terms that are coming your way, depending on the length of the meeting. Um, it can be pretty confusing. So uh, I, too, am in support of these, um, just from the standpoint that you know I think it ultimately benefits the kid that are, um, that are subject to the IEP meetings, the 504 meetings. And um, it ultimately benefits the parent as well. Uh, and you know, any 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 other issue with litigation, any other issue with you know potential costs, you know, those are the things that we can work together on to try to figure out. I want to wait. So this is a, um, a a fairly complicated issue that's been facing Columbia Public Schools um, in the very re in recent months. Um, <coughs> We've been asked by a, a group of uh, parents to review the policy that exists now. So I want to sort of draw to everyone's attention. There are two kinds of recording, right? Right now, uh, federal law requires that a school district allow parents to record those, those meetings when they need to do so in order to meaningfully participate in those meetings. So um, being presented with a question of what's my position on it, it's easy. You comply with the law. Uh, you allow parents to record when they need to do so in order to meaningfully participate. Um, the second nuance to this question um, is whether or not a parent should record or have the affirmative right to record by virtue of our public school policies um, when they don't need it as an accommodation to allow them to meaningfully participate as would be contemplated under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, in that circumstance, it becomes a little bit more touchy. It becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, so difficult, in fact, that state legislation is currently pending with respect to this issue. Um, and if passed, it's passed uh, the committee at the moment, um, if passed would uh, put in place a mandate that statewide would require that school districts, every single one of them, um, allow for parents to record IEP meetings and 504 meetings and the like uh, in order to have those recordings in their possession to review if they sh uh, should uh, choose to do, to do so. All right. <clears throat> Helen did an excellent job of getting a lot in there uh, in her brief period of time, and it's always difficult to go out, uh, after Helen uh, with her legal expertise. Um, I, I agree with her. I think that was an insult, by the way. I, <laughs> much a compliment. It's very beneficial to have an attorney. Um, I, we absolutely do need to be compliant with the law, and we are parents that need the accommodation, absolutely, or a student participating in their own IEP meeting, or for that matter, a teacher that wanted to participate, needed accommodation under the law, absolutely has the ability to do so and a right to do so. Um, what I have, and, and members of the board have charged, uh, there's an active committee working right now, task force, not only of staff, but also community members, and some of the um, members of the community that have um, raise this issue and have questions about the policy. That committee is working together on um, better solidifying the procedures because as, as Helen stated, we can record now and one of the biggest challenges that the district has is the procedures for recording and the opportunity of recording and the devices we need to recording, we don't have enough of them. So we want to make sure that, that we, if a, if a person requests the ability to record, the right to record, that we can provide all of the tools that they need. And then more importantly, because a recording of a meeting of this nature would be considered part of a 
student's permanent record, making sure that we have the infrastructure in place that we can store that file for as long as we need to, which as some text folks would know, with tech folks would know, it's a big file, uh, but we need to store that for 23 years. So we need to make sure, as uh, Chris had mentioned, that we have the technology um, in place to record and store those files. And we're working to do so. There is no, uh, just, uh, I guess I should go to here. There's no law now saying that Columbia Public School District couldn't write their own unilaterally law saying anyone who wants to record can record these. No, there's not. In fact, um, you, you, this has probably been something that you've read in um, you know, newspaper publications on this issue, but um, Missouri is one of those states that is a, a, a one-party consent state. So. Um, you know, people talk about wiretapping violations and those sorts of things, but Missouri is a state where one party can record um, without the other party knowing. Um, and so, no, there's no prohibition against um, the school district crafting a policy that would be um, uh, affirmatively enabling of all types of recording. Okay, Chris Horn, you get the first one on this one. I talked to a, a school administrator recently, and this administrator said that one thing that this person has on the table to handle regularly is talking to parents about the new school boundaries for next year and yeah. those who are un, not pleased with where they see that their especially older child is going to be going to school. So my uh, question, I'll start with this question. What benefits do you think that there was to having Columbia Public Schools hiring an outside consultant to assist with redrawing attendance areas for the middle schools and high schools. They went outside and then approved what was suggested. So, um, so that's a good one. Um, you know, boundary issues are hard, right? Um, you know, as a, as a kid that, like I mentioned earlier, had the benefit of moving every four or five years, um, you know, it was tough for me to, uh, you know, be in eighth grade and all of a sudden have to move to a completely different state. So um, I get it, I get that these are hard. Um, but you know, um, I think that using an outside firm shows a level of commitment on behalf of the board and the district. Um, it just shows us they care and that they're doing everything that they possibly can to try to solve this, this hard issue. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are invested, a lot of parents, a lot of students, a lot of community members that are invested um, in what the boundaries are going to be. And so, um, so therefore, there are a lot of people that have really good ideas about how to do this. Um, and so, I think that you know, when you when you when you seek the opinion of a, of a third party consult, excuse me, consulting firm, you just get an objective opinion and kind of help mitigate some of the uh, you know the inherent biases that we have with wanting to make sure that our kids remain in the schools that they're used to. And so, um, so I, I think that you know, like again, it shows a level of commitment. Um, to say we're trying to do everything that we can to make sure that we make the best decision possible for everybody. You were among those who decided, <laughs> yes, we could contract that out. I was. Um, the boundary issue, it is an ever difficult topic. Um, when I was a kid, I moved every single year uh, during elementary school, twice in middle school and four times in high school. I went to military school. I've moved a lot. And as a kid, that was just how I grew up. It, it didn't seem strange to me that I was always the new kid. I just was always the new kid, you know? It's just how it was. But now as an adult, having my child have roots in Columbia and have uh, an opportunity to, be, to become part of the fabric of not just a community, but a school community, I understand why parents don't want to be constantly facing change. Um, they want consistency and stability for those uh, their students, their children. Um, and as a member of the board, I want the same thing. Hiring an outside consultant uh, <coughs> enabled us to be able to make data-based decisions um, so that we could draw boundaries in such a way that would uh, relieve overcrowding, excuse me, overcrowding where necessary, would, to the extent that we can, maintain community-based <coughs> schools that are a reflection of the community as a whole, um, enhance the ability of students to be able to walk to school if they, if they are able to do so. Um, it was a stream or of a streamlined process led by a company whose job it is to look at the information, to look at the community, to look at the population, um, and present to us scenarios that accomplish the goals that our community set for us 
um, ensure that our schools are populated in a way that maximizes the benefit of the education being delivered, um, and do so in a data-based and research-based fashion, and involve the community in every step in a clear and concise way. I thought it was a, a, an excellent process last time. Um, I agree it was an excellent process um, the you know, to, to say that we used a consultant this last time is to try to maybe suggest that we haven't always used a consultant um, the Board of Education is not experts in growth rates and um, uh, land cladding we are always counting on experts we contracted a service that not only specialized in that but also specialized in, in running the process and to make sure that um, it wasn't in unduly influenced and simultaneously made sure that the community was heard. There were focus groups after focus groups after focus groups that people got to participate in as they made that process, all following the guidelines that are set through policy as well as the missions and the, 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 the charges that were set by the Board of Education, which was based around you know, community schools. I'm going to slowly give away the street that I grew up on, but I grew up in a neighborhood that drove passed on the south side of town that drove past uh, Fairview Elementary to get over to Russell uh, every day. That's how I, my bus crossed in front of Fairview and got there because that's the way the attendance areas were drawn. Um, I, every time my parents would find out I had a friend that lived in the other attendance area, they were just like, oh, I've got to drive across town. You can't just ride your bike across Scott Boulevard, not at that era. Parts of Chapel Hill were still gravel. It, it, it wasn't a quick way to get around. so. Part of that charge was making sure that our, our school attendance areas were uh, contiguous so that we could feel, um, like, uh, so the schools could feel um, more neighborhood driven. Um, as a, if some of you remember the old high school attendance areas, we had students across the street from Hickman High School football field that were not able to participate in football because they didn't have the transportation to go to their attendance area down at Rock. And that's, that's across the street. And, and we corrected some of those issues. I have to agree with the, uh, the other three candidates here. And, and kind of like Chris and, and uh, Helen, I was kind of a nomadic child. I, every two years we moved. So it seemed normal to me that, as I said, I was the new kid all the time. Um, living here, uh, I, think, I think putting that decision not the decision, just the process and an outside consulting agency was the correct decision. Uh, we have a lot of competing socioeconomic, racial, ethnic groups in this city. Um, if you put that process within, it, it explodes into something that we want to try to avoid. So putting the process there and then bringing it back for the board and administration to then approve and say, yes, this, this does reflect the way our city looks, it does, does reflect the communities and the neighborhoods within the city was the right process. I'm going to ask another question about drawing the boundaries and uh, where Helen, are you going to go? Helen, wait, what that? I was like, where are your house drawn? <laughs> no, I don't care where mine is. <laughs> you know, um, my daughter's going to finish in the school that she is right now, no matter what you do. Um, <laughs> I only say that because she's a, she's a senior next year, and I don't think that they would move her. We have a grandfather. <laughs> yes, we do. So she's going to be okay. Well, my question is: I hear the talk, and I, I we asked the question about the getting a contracted service to do this, and I like the answers, and the answers were all good. And then you'll hear the talk about um, neighborhoods where you can walk to the schools. You know where I'm going to go with this one. We have neighborhoods that are going to be pretty homogenous if you look at them and draw the lines. So where do you, it seems to me like the school board came down on the lines of saying, let's try to keep it so it's more of a community school. But my question then becomes, what factor do you do to say we want to increase diversity? Because when you have a school that has a very low percentage of free and reduced lunch, and then you have another one not far away that has a very high percentage of that. Is that, is that good? So that's my question. Helen, you go first this time. So this, is, this sounds like a, um, an impossible goal and to some extent it is. Um, if we could wave a wand and ensure that every single one of our schools reflected the makeup of our community as a whole, uh, that would be ideal. But then you are gonna have kids doing what Jonathan described, going from one end of town, clear across the other end of town, to attend school with children that they may not see anywhere else. 
Um, when we draw boundaries, there is a very distinct balancing of those competing interests that is employed in coming up with a solution that the community gets on board with. Um, every time we look at our boundaries, which is something that we're not just going to do now, it's going to happen again and again in years to come because our community is growing and changing. Um, that question will be repeated. But when our consultant and the expert that we've selected to use now provides us with scenarios, there are a number of them. Um, and we, well, I'll speak for myself. As a board member, I want to know how the community feels about the different scenarios that are presented. Um, every time scenarios are drawn up, there are some that are weighted towards the neighborhood school, the walkable uh, routes to school. There are others that are weighted more towards uh, providing each school environment with a diversity that's reflected by our community. Um, and we seek and receive the feedback from our, our constituents, our taxpayers, the people who send their kids to school and eventually come up with a solution that fits the needs of the community. So is it good or is it bad? It's a challenge. That's what it is. And the story that I shared was, was not an over-exaggeration. The, the east side of 7th Street was, up until the attendance areas were changed, Rockbridge High School. You could sit on your front porch and, and watch a football game at Hickman, um, but be in the Rockbridge School District. And when, as a district, our watchwords are achievement, enrichment, and opportunity, if we don't have transportation that runs in the evening that can get a student from downtown Columbia all the way to the south side, that's an opportunity gap. That's a student who's not going to be able to participate in band and theater and athletics because they can't get down to the south side. Um, and, and the same, same goes no matter where we draw those attendance areas. Is we had examples of what <coughs> perfectly designed socioeconomic balance, demographic balance of Columbia map looked like. And um, it was absolutely bizarre. It was part of public record, you could go look at it. It was absolutely unachievable. It was the most bizarre and gerrymandered map that you've ever seen. Um, and it had kids from all over town driving every which way. Um, and that's, that's, not, um, that's not addressing the issue that's trying to find balance when we probably as a community need to be having a larger conversation about what does affordable housing look like in our community and what is transportation and access to transportation look like in our community. I'd have some of those questions for the city council yeah. candidates. Maybe we'll just here. come up here on the front row. <laughs> so I went from a, a middle school in Atlanta, Georgia, where the school was 98% black to a high school in Colorado Springs where I was one of only four kids, four, four black kids in the entire school of 800 students. Um, I say that to say when I made it to Rockbridge, it was, it was almost culture shock. You go from these two different areas where the boundaries are drawn almost deliberately to focus folks into a certain area to Rockbridge where yes, there were the crude jokes about whatever, but it's much better than where, where it was, where I came from. So is it perfect? No, but we are trying. The school district is trying. I can applaud the school district for doing that. <clears throat> My bigger concern is, as David mentioned, some of these schools have uh, disproportionate numbers of students who have free lunch compared to other schools. Are we providing the same resources in these different areas as we are at Rockbridge and Hickman and Battle? Are the kids who go to Blue Ridge receiving the same resources as my kids who go to Gentry and Mill Creek? We can talk about the boundaries, but are the resources there? Do we have the same level of teachers there? Do we have the same resources in the form of counselors there and books? That's the bigger concern. Do those kids have the same opportunities where they're based at now? as the kids in other areas of the city. Um, yeah, this is, like everybody's mentioned, this is a tough issue. And 
you know, it's it's not impossible, but it is impossible to make a decision to keep everybody happy. <clears throat> you know, in my in my in my visits, uh, visiting with educators and administrators, um, one of our educators had a, a pretty cool idea. Of course, it needs to be vetted and tested, but you know, you know, you can abandon the notion of having walkable neighborhood schools because of the way our demographics are in our city, and we could just do vertical or diagonal districts. You know. <laughs> You want to talk about you know creating equity most schools will do that but then again we're into a whole bunch of transportation issues people are not going to be happy um, so that's you know there there are solutions um, or you know um, we can all individually go on journeys and think about kind of when we're making decisions on where we decide to live um, you know we can think about try to break down the notion in our head that certain schools are better than others you know like i said um, going to college here, I believe that certain schools are better than others. And I was exposed to really what's going on in our districts and I'm like, every school is great. So um, it's it's not it's not an issue that can simply be solved with the school or with the uh, Board of Education or with CPS. It's gonna take many sectors. You know, we need to cross sector this. We need to talk about affordable housing, we need to talk about transportation, we need to talk about access. It's gonna take a it's gonna take a community effort to really see the diversity in our schools reflect um, the community that we have. I kind of want to follow up on this in just a moment, but I want Mark to go ahead. I, I do too. Yeah. If I may. Yeah. And I didn't know if this is adequate. That's a good time. I mean, those of you who are going to ask a question, let me see you fidget or kind of get up and uh, I'll have to be at that microphone. And I apologize to Chris because I told him I would shut my student <laughs> mouth. I just came to listen, but sorry. Uh, first, Due to impending inclement weather and the timing of expected snowfall, Columbia Public Schools will not be in session on Wednesday, February 5th. Just in case you were wondering. Um, on the on on the drawing the boundaries, I thought that a great point was made that it ought to be data driven, and I think that is a wonderful way to be able to defend it. But what if you looked at this from another side of it? Draw the lines where they're supposed to be. But give grace to the people who are the ones that with common sense applied should just absolutely ordinarily be able to go to that other school. So give it up on that side. Do it data. Here's where the line is. The reason I say that is I went through this process with my daughter several years ago and she would have had to go to three different high schools in four years. <laughs> And I didn't think that was quite right, but it took me eight meetings with the school district and several appeals and several different things. And I didn't qualify on all the different qualifications, but it made absolute sense to me. Could we, could we amend the policy on the back end and draw it right on the front end? We're going to do this. Uh, I'll say this just because I know Mark and I'm going to give him a hard time. We'll start timing the questions here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm on the radio sometimes. <laughs> Jonathan, I think you're first up on this. Um, let's, let's do uh, 30 to 45 seconds. On yeah, this. and I'll keep it brief. Brief. I, um, I, I think that uh, if you and, and um, uh, Mark, I have no doubt you're going to text me later about this answer, but uh, I, I, I do believe that if you, you're making data-driven decisions, everyone's going to have a different opinion about where they're supposed to be quoting you exactly, um, uh, or where they make logical sense, because that's where the emotion part it gets into it, and, and why that I, I felt that the, the work of, of the consultant um, with the charge of our, our policy and the charge of, of the board's you know, factors that we wanted to consider was important because it did take, um, it, it, it took that, that individual, um, that, that, and maybe that personal agenda out of the situation. So Mark, I'm going to assume that you were in one of those districts that was kind of a square and then it had one of those little weird things, areas that juts out. <laughs> my neighborhood always gets caught in this because we're real close to the line. Right. So And my daughter went from a private school to a public school to a redistricted public school and now. Right. So I, I would say, we talked about a common sense solution there. Maybe once we do this again, we say, all right, we've got these districts or we've got these, these areas where the schools are. If you are within a certain mileage radius of, a, of this school here, 
then this this sort of trumps this. So if you're in that little weird area that juts out, yes, you need to go to the school up here, but you're also only five miles away from the school to the south. So and we say, okay, well, this is an option for that parent or that student. I don't think enough students are affected by it to make it out to be this giant issue to where we can't try to address something like that. Yeah. But you're right, that those kind of common sense solutions are something that we could we could take into account. <laughs> Mark, uh, one of the words that you said, you said some good words, but one of the ones that stood out to me most, you used the word grace. And we're trying to figure these things out, right? Uh, we're trying to answer hard questions and find solutions that are best for everybody. And we know that we can't provide one solution that works for everybody. And so uh, I think, you know, I think we all need it, but we all need to give it, particularly in this space. Uh, but you know, as I sit here and think out loud, which can get pretty dangerous. <laughs> um, you, know, you know, one thing I think about is, you know, we've got lottery schools. So maybe we have lottery options for people that fall in your situation. Um, I don't know if that's just an idea, but I think that's what's excellent about having a board and um, you know, putting it, making it incumbent upon the board and the administration to work with the community um, and with these third-party consulting firms what it has to be to answer these hard questions. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark, if I could just put it a little differently, is your question why can't common sense drive government policy? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's that with the words at least sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, when we look at these boundaries, we do do, to some extent, what you um, have articulated. Uh, what does the data say? Um, if we were to be blind um, as to the needs of a particular family or a particular neighborhood, what would be the computer-generated answer, yeah. right? Um, and once that computer-generated perfect answer um, is developed, and sometimes there's more than one answer to the question, um, there is an analysis of the way in which that particular answer or answers affects people and communities. Um, there is intention to provide relief uh, to families in particular um, who are gonna be facing multiple moves. Um, with the consultant that we use now, we are able to drill down into the data that we're provided down to the household level to see, wait, is this a neighborhood that we moved last time? Is this a neighborhood we moved twice, um, and one of the things that we specifically, had, that I specifically articulated was um, a desire to avoid that. Um, but when we have, we do have many personal requests. I mean, it may surprise you how many people do ask, well, but I have this reason, or that reason, or a geographical reason, or some other reason why I ought to be able to go to the school. Um, we slide away from the concept of being equitable to all students and all parents when we start to consider in too much granular detail each and every exception to the rule um, without <coughs> articulating a very specific criteria uh, to which to apply the exception. It might be a little mealy mouth, but it's the best one I can get. Okay, an audience question. Thank you. Um, so I'm a my son's grown, but I had a son go through the wonderful um, Columbia school system. Um, um, I'm going to ask a question that's kind of more national, maybe even global, and I'd like your feedback on it. It's something that I raised with the superintendent and got some positive response, and also Representative Kip Kendrick and Blake. Um, so we've had a lot of tragedies this summer, um, really terrifying, and probably terrifying to a lot of our students um, as a result of guns. Um, it's, it's a national issue, but it's also now a very local issue. So I have a public health background, and I wondered, we have two public health semesters in our schools. Could we not have something in the curriculum that sort of addressed gun safety? And Representative Hendrick suggested conservation has a gun safety curriculum in their Hunter education. And so I kind of like your feedback on that. The superintendent was interested he maybe looked at the outdoor classroom, but I actually think the older students, like the ninth grade public health class, if they're like part of the semester, would be a better place for this, because it is a public health issue. So, your feedback. David, Seaman is up first. So, I'm gonna tell you that as a Marine, um, gun safety is, is 
very important to me. Um, fire and safety, firearm safety in general, whether or not it's a ninth grader or a third grader or a kindergartner is important. Um, I could see us putting some type of curriculum into that. Um, it, it's, it's right up there, as you said, it's becoming much more prevalent, uh, especially here locally. Um, every few weeks we hear about something happening and unfortunately, because I know a lot of these folks, every few weeks I have to read about a name that I know from high school as either the perpetrator or the victim or sometimes both. Um, so yes, it, it is high important. It is something that we should definitely look into. Um, yeah, no, you're, you're 100% correct. Thank you. Chris, one. Uh, I mean, you know, we live in a state where a lot of people love their guns. And so, uh, and it's just those, like you already mentioned, it's no secret, all these tragedies that are happening, particularly here locally. You know, at, at the very least, I can see implementing extracurricular activities around gun safety. Um, I, would, I would not be opposed to having some sort of gun safety curriculum. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, anytime you have an opportunity to speak to the youth and to tell them about the dangers of these weapons, um, why not? And so certainly if there's capacity for it, there's space for it, there's opportunity for it, I would be all for that. Thank you. How are we going? Um, I think your direct question is, can we do it? Um, Columbia Public Schools can do just about anything if we think that that's gonna have a real effect um, on uh, our, our kids. And what you've articulated is true. Um, we do have um, a rising epidemic in Columbia of gun violence, and the school district is part parcel of the solution. Um, whether it's the delivery of a gun safety class as part of curriculum, or the introduction of something of that nature, um, as uh, I hate to use the word optional because when you do it, sort of tends to diminish the importance of the uh, of the topic. But um, if there was an, uh, a club or something like that, there they do exist, but in a different capacity to what you're thinking of. Um, I think that that's a good place to start. I also think that. Um, a school district plays a role in the safety of kids in general. Um, we have information and resources at our disposal that if used in connection with the resources at the city and the county level, could really make a difference in the lives of the kids who are potentially a perpetrator, potentially a victim, and make a difference before that tragedy actually happens. And that's something that I think we should, as a community and as a board, focus on in the years to come. John Princessions. Um, <clears throat> I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I've talked to Kip, I've talked to Dr. Stiebelman about this. I do think probably the easiest um, way to integrate uh, a gun safety education is, is at the nature school, which we're, we're opening okay. first. And I think that's a, that's a good first step, and I think that would be a way to, to integrate it. Um, you know, I, it's, it's a question of, of the safety of, of, of our citizens. Um, like in the, the, the I mean, it's, it, to some extent, Alice, I hear you asking, like, gun safety is a problem because there's a lot of people getting shot. Um, we don't, a day doesn't go by um, where there's not a shooting in the news. Um, and um, it's not something that I don't like the fact that we have to spend so much money as a district um, installing safety glass and and vegetables and uh vegetable vegetables um uh to to steer people in you know um i don't I, I don't like spending the money um on on modifying and fortifying our schools when we could be spending that money um to help educate students um i'm 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 have i missed the stop already no oh, okay um but i i it, do I think that maybe gun safety um, might help reduce this? I, I don't know. I don't have that answer. I don't think teaching students how to use a gun safely um, is going to um, solve the problem of, of, of a lot of the gun violence we see in our society. You ask as a national perspective, I think we need to start looking at issues of, of mental health. All right, thank you for your question. Um, I have a question that kind of goes back, I think David was saying this and answering the question about um, looking at schools that were appropriately diverse, and you said something about we need to make sure that we get the uh, same resources at each school. So this is my question. It's actually one that uh, someone who used to work in the school district, I asked for this person to give me some ideas, and I'm going to grow off of one of these questions. Teacher shortages exist in some areas like special education, math, and science. Should there be a, t a pay differential to recruit teachers in certain curricular areas? 
I would add to that a good friend of mine who was a sub a few years ago subbed at every single school in the district and said to me that there is a vast difference in these schools and this was a grown man who could take care of himself but said that it was very hard to teach in some schools should we not only have differential pay if we could work this out with the teachers I understand that but also in certain schools to try to attract more experienced teachers and better teachers at certain schools where the achievement level is lowest and the difficulty of of the school atmosphere so Chris Horn you're grinning you get the first one on this one um, I think that that would help uh, but I think it goes a little bit beyond that uh, you know when you start getting into sliding scales and pay for performance you know you, that gets a little tricky but you know you're t you, I mean you're addressing the these sub, our subgroups in our in our communities that just are underperforming and you know it's something that is not exclusive to Columbia it's something that everybody continues to talk about um, but we've got to start finding solutions for these and so uh, I wouldn't be opposed to that but I think beyond that um, you know we also have issues with uh, with um, with AIDS and other resources that uh, that these teachers need so you know, we need parents, we need more classroom aides, we need more instructional assistance. And so these are positions that, you know, are hourly paid and, you know, in an economy where the, where the unemployment rate is pretty low. Um, but on the flip side, the underemployment rate is, is not something to brag about. Uh, I think that we can create a, a, a better labor force um, and attract a better labor force by offering better pay incentives and so you provide the instructional aids, you provide the classroom aids, you provide the paras, particularly that you know our students with IEPs need, um, and then you start to you start to work on closing that gap for sure from that perspective. All the way. <laughs> okay, so um, you said something that I wanted to pick apart for a minute. The same is not the same as equitable, right? So every school in our district, every one of our 39 buildings has a very different student population in it. And providing the same resources to every single building does not do the same thing as uh, providing the right resources for the kids that attend that school, all right? Our district needs to be focused on ensuring that the resources that are necessary to that student, those students, our students achievement are provided when and how they need it um, with respect to differential pay with regard to teachers i think you're getting very very close to measuring teacher efficacy solely and exclusively by student performance there is more to it than that when you look at the formula that makes a student successful um, you're talking about not just what happens during the school day but the way in which parents and guardians and families um, are allowed to and encouraged to interact with the teaching community and the school community as a whole. Um, another thing you said, would it help um, the students uh, in the schools that um, may appear to require different teachers for the teachers to be better? I would challenge you to say every teacher in our district better be the best. Um, and I think if we make sure that we are putting that as our overarching goal is to make sure every teacher has the resources available to him or her to be the best teacher he or she can be and put them in a culturally competent position to meet the needs of the students that sit in his or her classroom regardless of which building it's in. Those are the kind of teachers that we want and those are the kind of teachers we need to find a way to compensate fairly. Really, Do you think we have culturally competent teachers in each and every classroom from Blue, Spur uh, Blue Ridge to uh, Mill Creek? I think Do you think that they have been evaluated well? Are we looking at them in a way that says, okay, these would work best in this classroom? So your first question was, is every teacher culturally competent? Uh, no. That's a priority of the district and should be an, an ever-rising priority um, going forward into the future. Um, are we looking at teachers based upon their appropriateness for each individual classroom? I think we're looking at them um, from the standpoint of their qualifications um, and whether or not they are the best kind of teachers for the district. But I will say this, it is meaningful for kids in the classroom to have a teacher or have an adult 
or have a mentor who looks like them. Um, and ensuring that we have a, a teaching force and an employee force that looks like every student is important and it should be a priority for the district as well going forwards. Um, David, how many of those questions would you like me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and deal David. with the, the basic one of um, would it be um, would it be something All that right. you would yeah. how do you respond to pay differential right. saying you know what to get a teacher who is experienced and has been tried and found Let's see how many of these excellent are to All get right. into a tough school situation. Helen, Chris, Wright, um, we are getting into a dangerous like performance-based evaluation where you are paying teachers based on uh, um, student performance, which um, in many cases um, would, you know, is it, it, not always within a control, especially when you consider some of our schools that are ex uh, high mobility. Um, when I say high mobility, I mean buildings that have a 75% mobility rate. What does that mean? It means a child that is there on the first day of school is 75% of that building is not there on the last day of school. That's a massive turnover. At one of those buildings, though, when we talk about that, that's, that's a major impact on what a school performance looks like. When you have 75% population turnover in a single building in a single year. But Chris commented a minute ago about recognizing what is actually going on at the building. Uh, Dr. Stiebelman and I pulled some data out of the highest mobility school last year. And in that building, there were, we asked who was there on the first day of kindergarten and who was there uh, and how many of those students were there on the last day of the fifth grade before they went in. There were 20. There were only 20. So over those six years, only 20 kids continued in that single building. But those 20 kids, 19 of them were advanced and the uh, eight and the twentieth was proficient, which is on a five point scale. I'm sorry, we're getting into like test standardized testing there. But what that tells me is if those students stay in a program with our highly qualified educators and the resources that we distribute equitably throughout the district, such as putting additional resources at schools, um, such as Babel is requested by the teachers because they said that they were in need. If students are in our buildings and they stay in our buildings, they are successful. And so what we need to talk about addressing is some of the challenges of our community and uh, the mobility rate and finding ways like, and I'm sorry I'm way over time, David, so I expect you to just be kind of rolling with this as well. But when we talk about things like a Blue Ridge Elementary, what a year-round school with wraparound services would look like, making sure that we provide transportation if they move out of that school attendance area, that we could get those students back into, that student that moves out, get that student back into Blue Ridge. Those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of unique ideas that Columbia Public Schools are looking at uh, to, to address um, some of the issues that, that doesn't come down to how do you incentivize to fill some of those roles? And then I have like a, like all the answers to all the other questions you asked. Your closing comments. All right. okay. <laughs> so so I agree. Um, I think once you start trying to pay teachers based on what school they're at, the perception becomes if you go teach at this school, you receive hazard pay almost because the school's bad. So those teachers can eventually leave that school. But as as uh, Jonathan. Jonathan Sessions. Jonathan Sessions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan just said, it's a long day. Right, yes, it's, it's going to be snowy out there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Thinking about tomorrow. It's jo as Jonathan just mentioned, the mobility rate there for a lot of those students is high as they go all the way through the school. But those first few years, they're still there. So they can't leave. They're still at that school where the perception has now become if you teach there, it's hazardous. I substitute taught as well for a few months before I joined the Marine Corps. And, and we're right. Some of these schools are completely different in child behavior. So you do get into a dangerous area there. Now, there's something that Jonathan just mentioned about uh, year-long school. And I think that's a great idea in some of these schools. Um, as we mentioned before, some of these kids, the only meal they may receive almost all day is that reduced lunch. So having them out of school for almost two months at a time sometimes puts in a huge burden on their parents 
puts a burden on the child. I think implementing that year-round school where they have a two to three week break during Christmas time and during the summer would help reduce some of that stress on the household and help keep those kids actually in school and paying attention to their, <coughs> and their parents involved in their education. I thought we had a question. No, we're okay. We're, on, we're sure? running short on time. Um, all right, well, we'll wrap it up. I would just ask in, in relationship to what you all just said, taking into account experience or number of years at a job, do you all, <coughs> does every lawyer in the law firm get paid equally? Does every employee that you have, Jonathan Sessions, or the better ones get paid more to take on the harder jobs? So one of the things that you're talking about is to incentivize the things that work, right? Mm -hmm. What does the data say works for kids? What get, the, get some of right. it. If you have a student, you know, to be honest, sure. at Mill Creek, who's going to succeed mm -hmm. pretty much regardless of who's in the classroom, but you can get a very effective, good teacher in Blue Ridge, or Derby Ridge or whatever you want to say, wouldn't it make sense for accomplishment to put the best where they're needed the most? Sure, I think, um, so two quick, quick answers. Firstly, um, there have been, uh, there's been a collaborative effort by the teachers um, and the administration to develop a different kind of compensation schedule for teachers in Columbia Public Schools than what we've had in the past. Um, and the overarching goal of the committee that was convened to look at the way we pay teachers is to incentivize the things that the data says works. What do we know works for kids? What does student achievement data reflect is effective in terms of teacher quality? And the three column salary schedule that we're operating off of now with the grandfather <coughs> provision in it for teachers who would otherwise have been disadvantaged by its implementation rewards teachers for the things that we know work. Ex years of experience, education, uh, and, um, you know, development as a professional. Now, does it make sense to take a teacher who has, you know, we have a teacher in our district, her name is Kathy Steinhoff. She's a very uh, a much revered teacher. We, uh, would we put her in a place where she could potentially have the most effect? That's where she is. Um, our teachers in general, when we place them in buildings, there are a number of factors that uh, contribute to the decision of, with regard to where to place them. One of which is, what, are this, what, what qualities does this teacher have that fits with the building and the classroom in which we contemplate them teaching? Um, so in some sense, common sense does prevail in that regard. However, I can't stress enough that a, the success of a student has a lot more to do with Mult and multiplicity of factors, both school-based and otherwise, beyond the quality of the teacher in the room. Well, I'll have to be real quick on this. I, yes, would, I will turn to you know, one of the questions you asked earlier is, is about support, and there are many support structures that surround our students, and uh, that are that are that are people on an hourly schedule, on an hourly rate. And one of the things that this board is actively working towards is making sure that all individuals in the office, or all individuals are working for the Columbia Public School. Oh, by the way, you asked how much I pay myself the least uh, in my office from your question. Yeah, right. I pay myself the least for your question. Um, but you can do that with Peter Stiefelman. So uh, yeah, so, um, <laughs> but when it comes to our hourly workers, we need to get that rate to $15 an hour. Um, it is for many of our specialties, but it needs to be that way for everyone. Um, that's what's going to allow us to have more paras and classroom aids. Um, at the same time, you know, we have a program that we found in Ann Arbor that's a federal program. I'm sorry, Gainesville, Florida, it's a federal program, and it's what gives dinner to students. All students at Hickman, Battle, um, uh, Douglas, and Rockbridge. Any student, if they're there for an after school activity, they can get a lunch. We've ex our dinner after school because they're there for after school programs. We've expanded that to two middle schools. We would love to expand that to more, but per some of the conversation we've had today, it's hard to find staff that will work um, when we have unemployment rates as low as they are in Columbia. So the only way that we're going to be able to compete, the only way that we can fill some of those jobs where we know we have gaps is if we're at a competitive salary range. And that's where we've got to get, especially for our hourly workers. David, see so, Let's just be honest, yeah, I, the schools that we're talking about are primarily minority schools. There are minority students in those schools. 
Um, my fear is that <laughs> if we increase that pay scale to where, yes, we're gonna pay teachers more to, to go teachers these schools, do those schools go from being quote unquote bad schools to now they're just outright dangerous schools? And do we now have teachers who just refuse to go teach there? And do those kids now suffer because of it? As Helen said, the majority of the factors that affect these kids are outside the school. They're in the community, they're in their family life. Um, if we are now trying to pay teachers more, our quote unquote best teachers to go into these schools, are we setting them up for failure by not trying to address all the other issues? Because you could put the best teacher on the planet in some of these classrooms, and if nothing is being done in the community or to help out that family, they're still going to fail. So do we create teacher burnout in that instance? Do we create that perception that, yes, these kids are not only bad, but they're dangerous in their communities? Those are things that have to be addressed and thought about before we start talking about increased pay for some of these schools. Chris, uh, you know, <coughs> our conversations with, with our educators, with our administrators, uh, I haven't met one that said, I don't care about these kids. Every, every single one of them um, absolutely love what they do. And we haven't had conversations about compensation. Now, maybe because it's inherent, but um, everyone that I've talked to said they love what they do, they're committed to their kids, and I mean, they're committed to seeing their kids succeed. What I have heard them say is, you know, I'm here to educate. I don't know what to do when this student behaves in this manner, or I don't know what to do when this student um, creates, presents a, a danger to themselves or to others. And so it's not, I don't think it's so much an issue as making sure that our teachers are compensated while that's very, very important. Um, I think it's making sure that they have the aids and the resources and the parents that they need to make sure that they can focus on doing what they love to do. Let me uh, ask one more question. I promised somebody who emailed me today that I would work this one in. So 60 seconds for each of you. Jonathan, you're first. Okay. About one in eight students or 12% or 1,700, however you like the number in the Columbia Public Schools, receive special education services that are required by federal law. What's one strength of the district's special education services department and what is one area where that special services department needs improvement? Our teachers is our strength. Our teachers is absolutely our strength. Um, our, our teachers love our students. They they come to work every day to help, and and they they want to be there. Um, they are passionate about education and providing support to all of our students, whether that's someone that's uh, a student. So that's a that's a long spectrum of services. So it might be someone that's um, got a a, um, a a student that has a kind of a permanent aid beside them, or it might just be a student that has um, like ADHD. Uh, so that's a big spectrum, but our teachers know how to serve our students. Um, weaknesses, um, I, we need to, um, one of the things that has become clear to me uh, as, as a board member is we definitely need to provide resources to our families, because many of our families as they enter in to IEP meetings, 504 meetings, it is a new world, there is new language, there is new acronyms, and um, it can be an emotional conversation to have. Um, so we need to make sure that as a district, we are providing support to our families experiencing that for the first time or ongoing, um, uh, as many support structures for our families as we are for the students that we're serving. David C. I agree with that. I think the strength here is teachers. As Chris said, I've never met an educator that said, I don't care about these kids. If you go into this profession, you care about these children. Um, and it's, it's pretty obvious. Having spoken with some of these special education groups around the city, um, it, it appears that we are almost busing some of these special education kids from the schools that they should be going to to other schools because there are better resources there. Um, you're taking these kids out of the schools, away from the kids that they play with in their neighborhoods, the ones that they see every day. Uh, you're taking them away from them to put them here. So uh, that's that's a big weakness there. If we're going to support these families and support these kids, they should be in those areas that they should be in, within those boundaries, going to the same schools 
as their peers, as their friends in the neighborhood. Chris. That's interesting. Um, you know, kind of on the flip side of that, um, I can see how you can see that as a weakness. I can see that kind of as a strength because I think the uh, the district recognizes that, you know, the resources are short. And so I think they go out of their way um, to identify where we can place the kids where they can best be served. And I think it's interesting that we've got in each of our buildings, uh, based on the resources that are available in those buildings, we've got special, our, our, you know, sections, or excuse me, school or excuse me, classrooms and resources available to address um, the IEPs as prescribed in, in these kids with these special needs. So uh, I think it's, I, I think that's a strength that they, uh, they go out of their way to identify the needs, obviously, and getting them into places where they can best be served. Um, it's also a weakness because, it, again, it goes back to what I talked about, making sure that we, we have a shortage of parents. You know, worst case scenario, um, you know, I've, I've met with community members who have had a kid or kids that have got prescribed IEPs, and their, their prescription says that they need Paris, they need AIDS, and that kid doesn't have the parent. So what happens? They behave just as they were um, prescribed. Maybe they misbehave or be, uh, perceived as misbehaving, and then they get taken out of their school, sometimes handcuffs, because they didn't have the resources that they need. It's not that kid's fault. That kid's doing exactly what professionals said he was going to do. And so that that's probably the, uh, the the biggest thing that we need. We need just to make sure that they have the resources that they need to uh, to succeed. And Helen. Um, so it sounds a little bit like a choir over here, but um, our special education department, uh, not just the teachers, but um, the counselors, the liaisons, the administrators, the team that convenes to uh, ensure that our students who participate in special education receive the kind of education that can provide a foundation for them to, to excel. Um, special education is often thought of as something that uh, serves children who aren't going to excel. We just want to get them by. We want them to excel because they can. Um, we do have weaknesses. Um, I think that we need to focus on the fidelity with which the special education services are delivered from building to building. There needs to be consistency from building to building. It shouldn't be different. It should be the same. Um, with respect to our, um, uh, I suppose, uh, lighting the pathway for parents who are new to the process of special education or IEPs or 504s. Um, what is this about? What are we doing here? What federal laws are they? We're talking um, about providing more of a menu of services. What can we do to help you understand so that you can help your student? Um, third, I think that our district, um, we are making strides toward this, but we need to focus on not just ADA compliance. Are we compliant? with the requirements of the federal law, but is our district both the physical plant and the delivery, delivery of the education accessible to all of our students and all of our parents? We have to uh, go to closing statements right now. We're gonna start with Chris Horn and move down this way since we went the other way on opening statements. So please, whatever you wanna say here at the end for a couple of moments. Whatever I wanna say. Whatever you wanna <laughs> say. <laughs> um, you know, I usually don't like to, to brag about kind of serving others because I think it's something that should quite honestly be done in silence. But I think it's important that you guys know that uh, you know I'm committed to service. Uh, I mentioned earlier going through Leadership Columbia, learning more about our community, and really learning more about myself and knowing better and wanting to do better. So I think it's important to know that uh, you know I, I, I'm active in our community. You know. Uh, I've got the benefit of advocating for some of our most vulnerable youth by uh, serving on the board of Harlem Missouri Casa. Um, you know, this is not my first venture into interacting with the students that we serve through CPS. You know, I, uh, I serve as a mentor through the Mobile Woke program. Every month I meet with uh, sophomores over at Hickman High School. Um, I get the opportunity or had the opportunity to serve uh, in the capacity of a panelist and a, and a board. Um, for the uh, Mac Achievement Scholarship two years in a row. Um, and you know, with Shelter, uh, we're a partner in education, and our, 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 our partner in education is West Middle School, and uh, I'm blessed with the, with the ability to be appointed to that committee uh, through Shelter. So, uh, 
service is something that I'm about, service is something I'm committed to, um, and service is something that I want to do, um, hopefully with the opportunity to serve our youth in the best way possible. You know, We talked about making changes in our education system, in our community, I mean, what better way than to serve our youth, to serve our kids. And so, um, you know, some of the things um, that we stand for, like that I stand for our teachers, I want to make sure that we provide the best positive work environment for our teachers, you know, our students directly benefit from it. You know, if our teachers are happy, our kids directly benefit from that. Um, I also want to continue the efforts that the district's doing through our diversity, inclusion, and, uh, and equity efforts. Um, I think that's super important, particularly when you have, you know, a, uh, a demographic in our student population, our student or teacher population that doesn't right now reflect the uh, students that they serve. So it's important that they understand uh, who they're teaching. And, um, you know, uh, again, uh, I, I think it's important that we expand the, the reach of our early education programs. Um, you know, if we can get our kids in pre-K age in a position where they're not playing catch up by the time they're in the kindergarten, we set them off for success going forward throughout their education journey. And so, uh, you know, hopefully I get the opportunity to serve. Um, and if I do get that opportunity, I'm gonna do it the best way I know how. And the best way I know how is to, uh, you know, through grace and truth and that takes time, that takes good relationships, but I think that's the most effective way to see the changes that we all want to see. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. You take a seat, please. So I, I can sit here and just reiterate everything I've said and tell you a little bit more about myself, but I like to take this opportunity to talk about something that's important to me, um, and that's just voting overall. We are all up on the ballot April 7th. Um, I think everyone in this room is aware that this is a year that we're going to have another large election coming up. Um, it, it doesn't really matter to me who you vote for. What matters to me is that you actually vote. Um, I have friends who are deployed overseas, or are stationed here in the U.S. still. Um, as I said, it doesn't matter who you vote for in my mind. Your vote, though, in my mind, is a way to ensure that, that they remain safe. Um, and that's very important to me. So as I said, who you vote for doesn't really matter to me as much as the fact that you vote, that you tell your family to vote, your friends, the person behind you in the grocery store. Please make sure you vote and that they vote. Um, it, it's, it's extremely important. Um, I want to thank the Board of Realtors for having an amazing forum tonight. I want to thank my friend David um, for an excellent night of moderation. And I, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out and listening to us drone on about very important issues. Thank you. Jonathan. Um, thank the Board of Realtors. Thank you all for coming out. I know like everyone's stressing about what the weather's out up there. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to ask for your vote on April 7th. I'd also ask, like to take this opportunity and ask for your vote, yes, for the no tax increase bond issue. Um, 10 years ago, I got on the Board of Education and we had 175 trailers in the Columbia Public School. I went into a meeting, I realized we were counting the Eco Schoolhouse at Grant as a trailer, so right there, one meeting, I got it down to 174. <laughs> 10 years later, with an actual bond strategy, a proper bond strategy, actually looking into the future and asking our community to tax themselves two, well, you know, over four years, twice in a row, to then come back and put us in a place where we could do no tax increase bond issues every two years. We will be opening John Warner Middle School, we're going to be opening the renovated Locust Street Elementary, and we're going to be sub-20 trailers in this district, and those 20 trailers, a good portion of them, are not going to be used for academic classrooms. That is a massive achievement, and that is an achievement that takes long-term planning. That takes fiscal responsibility. When we got on the Board of Education, we weren't forecasting our finances. We now have a five-year fiscal plan, so we know what our reserves are going to look like five years from now. I got on the board and we were laying teachers off and freezing salaries. I never want to be in that place again. I want to be prepared should there be another academic down or uh, fiscal downturn. What We have three watchwords, achievement, enrichment, and opportunity. And I've talked a lot about what the, the, the finances and the machine and the business and all of that. But in the 10 years I've been on the board, we've gone from an 81% graduation rate to a 90% graduation rate. Our black students have gone from a 67% graduation rate to an 82% graduation rate. 
We continue to expand opportunities throughout the district, investing in the enrichment part, investing funds and eliminating the pay for play that you see at some schools, whether that's musical instruments or athletic uniforms, so that every student has an opportunity to participate. And we have programs that we've implemented that are providing opportunity. Opportunity such as the early college program that we saw up in Ann Arbor, where students are gonna be able to spend the last two years of their high school career going to Mobile Area Community College and then potentially go the Mizzou to Mac route and get out of the university within a couple years of graduating from high school with their associates, uh, associates degree simultaneously. This is an amazing opportunity for our students. They'll be able to take AP classes too. That's a question of all they do that. Um, but these are the kinds of programs, the academic side, that we I don't think we get to spend enough time in these forums talking about um, because we are truly seeing amazing strides and achievement. And I'm sure I'm over my, I'm sure I missed the stop sign a minute ago. So what I will say is, you got to hold that up a little. I did like wave it at me. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, but th these are the kinds of programs that I think are important to Columbia Public Schools. I thank you for your opportunity, and I ask for your vote on April 7th. And how do we wait? Well, um, it probably goes without, without saying thanks for having us here and having the heat on. Um, huh. You know, being a member of the Columbia Public Schools Board of, Ed Board of Education for nine years does make me an incumbent, but I'm not complacent. I'm running again for the fourth time because there is still work to do. If I thought I was done, I would quit. We're not done. There are challenges that this district faces this year that are different from what they were last year. They're gonna be different in two years and in three years. And having had nine years of experience on the board, I know how to work through those issues. I can be critical, I can be analytical, and I've learned how to listen to the differing voices that this community comprises. Um, Columbia Public Schools is committed to making sure that every child, every child, whether they are an academic, um, they, whether they excel academically, whether they excel athletically, whether they excel in theater and arts or in math and engineering, every student receives the very best education that they can possibly receive. I am committed to making sure that that continues and improves and that every student needs what they need and looking at that through a lens of equity to be the best kid that they can be. It's very important that the public school system in this city continues to be an excellent public school system. As I said at the opener, it's the foundation of our community. It's the backbone of our economy. And to feed it and to feed our children and to put their education and their success first ultimately puts Columbia first. And that's what's important. Uh, my name is Helen Wade. I'm available should you have any questions. But I would ask for your vote on April 7th. Thank you for attending and waiting out the weather. I appreciate it. I think that there will be an opportunity for you to talk about more of these things, and you probably will have another forum or two between now and April. In April, early, the first Tuesday of April, you'll have an opportunity to vote for up to three of these uh, members. There are three positions that will be filled on the school board for the next term, and I uh, appreciate what they have said tonight. I think this has been a good opener, and I think uh, we've got great candidates. Thank you all for being here. A round of applause. And And then we'll have our city council portion of the evening.